and we need to focus on raising our vibration and our consciousness. Well, I, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's beautiful here. Beautiful. How do you qualify as a whistleblower? The definition is a person who informs on a person or an organization that is engaged in illicit activity. People feel from their conscience they need to come forward. So there are a lot of laws that are put in place to keep secrets. Most of these unacknowledged programs are illegal by their very definition. So those who have been ordered to keep silent are breaking the law. They're not uh, uh, upholding the law. Now in most cases for a whistleblower, you're going to need documentation, supporting physical evidence, and testimony. Testimony is, you can enter testimony as evidence in a court of law. So testimony has to be backed up with supporting evidence and the proper documentation, which is hard to obtain with civilian assets, but military assets, you have their processing papers, their DD-214. Compartmentalization it has been used to a major degree to prevent people within the same organization from having access to the same information. There can be, usually, everyone is told they're at the top of the totem pole with uh, intelligence. And each one of these people, they believe it so strongly, if you come with information that's above what they have been told they are, they will disbelieve it because their egos believe that they have the highest information in the land. And of course, testimony, because the way compartmentalization works, you can be shown very sensitive papers, photos, videos, but it's done in what is called a skiff room. It is a room that is, um, it blocks all signals from technology from coming in, and the information cannot leave that skiff room. So therefore, it is impossible for these documents to make it out to the public. So how does my story begin? How many people here have watched Cosmic Disclosure? Okay. Well, uh, if you go to blueavians.com, you can watch some free episodes for those who have not seen it. And uh, it is translated into Spanish. I used to think that my involvement in the programs began just from some testing that I did and I popped up um, on their radar. But it turns out that my family is a part of a multi-generational experiment that began in World War II. My uh, grandfather was a Seventh-day Adventist, which is a, um, a non-violent, very non-violent uh, sect of Christianity. And um, he was drafted into the military but because of his religious beliefs, they gave him a choice to join a program to where he wouldn't have to engage in combat. And that program was similar, but not Project White Coat. It was very similar. They would inject them with viruses and bacteria that were commonly found on the battlefield, and then they would develop treatments for it. That was the cover story. What was actually occurring is that in 1945, before we had supposedly discovered DNA, they were already manipulating DNA using viruses as a delivery system. And I'm a product of that experiment. Growing up, it was never a big secret that my grandfather was a part of an experiment. Um, we were told never, never ask him about it. He was, he was 
very upset. He was a very proud, vain man. And when he was given the injections, he became so ill that um, they, they were, when, while they were taking care of him, they put a bunch of pillows behind his back, and his back fused in a curved manner. And um, he was like this um, ever since I was born. That's, that's how I knew him, and he, he was a very proud man. Recently, um, Dr. Sala and um, some of his associates submitted a Freedom of Information Act. I was told not to say FOIA because it might get a, <laughs> an interesting uh, reaction from the Spanish speakers. <laughs> <laughs> but the Freedom of Information Act, it, it didn't uh, give us the information we wanted, and the medical information about my grandfather only went back to, I believe, 1984. So there was a huge gap. Now, of course, America has a huge history of uh, unsuspecting tests on its citizens and soldiers. The Tagiski uh, airmen, they were giving them syphilis on purpose. And finally, there was an apology, but, uh, you know, the, I mean, this just goes to show the level of governments, and it's not just the American government, that um, you'd think they would test on an in enemy population, but they test on their own population. Now, I was brought into the MyLab program, which stands for Military Abduction, and uh, this is a program that identifies children that have certain gifts, and then usually these people identify as starseeds as I'm sure all of you do. What the military's goal was, was to find these star seeds before they engaged in their mission and to turn them to the dark side, so to speak, and to use them as a tool. And this is done at a, at a level that's very sickening. And of course they use both civilian and military assets. They mostly use military assets in the 20 and back programs. Rarely do they use civilians. Yeah, there's a picture of me. At, I think I was seven there. So they developed standardized testing to be able to identify uh, a number of different things that they're looking for for the programs. One of them was they were looking for intuitive empaths to help them interface with non-humans. Usually they already had a good idea who these empaths were because they track every alien abduction that occurs. Almost every abduction that occurs, the military comes in, re-abducts them, goes through, they, they do a debriefing with them, usually under chemi chemical means, pharmaceuticals, then they give them more screen memories, which really confuses them after they've already had that done by the non-terrestrials. And then they return them back to, um, back home. They just, they, they gather intelligence after they're abducted. And this is done on a wide scale in almost every country. Now, in the beginning they used a lot of children, a lot of military assets in these programs. But later on in the most recent years, they've started using clones. They, were, they, they grow clones, and then they become programmed life forms. They are not as uh, efficient as an Earth-grown human, though. Efficient in doing these different uh, jobs, like interfacing with aliens. They don't have the experiences that we have on Earth to uh, add to the communication, which is very important. About an hour from where I grew up, there was a base called Carswell Air Force Base. It was a, um, I think it was the seventh bomber wing. Now, after they identified me in school as being an asset, they found a way to pull me out of normal classes into different classes. Sometimes I would be in classes with extremely gifted people, and sometimes I'd be in classes with people that were wearing diapers. I mean, they, they were people that uh, were underdeveloped, but they just wanted me out of the mainstream curriculum so that they could remove me from school at any point. Under Carswell Air Force Base, for um, 
during, of course, the Cold War, everyone thought nuclear war was going to happen. They built a huge underground facility. That underground facility connects to the underground uh, magnetic train system, the maglev system. And recently, there are two different people I've described where I went in, uh, which I went in the back gate, I, I crossed two airstrips, went through another checkpoint, and then drove into a large motor pool hangar that was kind of like an airplane hangar with the doors opened. And I would go in, and there would be windows on the second floor overlooking where all the vehicles park. Their program is to basically, like Noah's Ark, keep uh, the human genome safe from extinction by keeping part of it underground and part of the human race on other planets. So we don't have all of our eggs in one basket, as I say, in Texas anyway. So they do, there's a lot of cloning that goes on that's been going on for a long time. Anything that is unethical on the surface, surface to do research-wise is either going on in Antarctica in their R&D bases or below ground. A major area is in Mexico, the zone of silence. Uh, they have, originally they called it an NBC facility, uh, Nuclear Biological Chemical Development, but they do quite a lot of uh, cloning there and uh, very disturbing experiments. This is, you've probably seen this on the internet, this is very old and uh, somewhat accurate of the, the maglev or magnetic trains that go underground, they go to all these different bases and it shows it going off to uh, down to Central and South America, but I haven't seen any maps that show the details of South America. That goes through a lot, a lot through Brazil, Argentina. So a lot of the training that we had when we were taken underground, we were interfacing with technologies that there would be like plates that you put your hand on or two little protrusions in a chair that connect to, you know, the dimples in the back of your shoulders? That's an area where a lot of nerves crisscross. And that is a place to where if they have this node, this metal node, positive, negative, going that you lay back against, and also plates that you can put your hands on, it is a neurological interface to technology. The things you see out of your eyes, you completely believe. You hear, you smell, you taste. They can manipulate all of that. You, one of the major tests is for you to be able to determine when you've been put into some sort of a virtual reality simulation. They're so real, it's very difficult. And of course, at the, back then, at the end of every session, you were chemically blank slated, which means mind erased and given screen memories. If you were you left school, your memories would be that you went to a natural uh, history museum and, and looked at dinosaur bones, when in actuality you had gone underground and had been subjected to all kinds of terrible experiments. You come home and you have all this trauma from what? Seeing dinosaur bones? You know? So it was hard to explain the trauma that we would have and the bad dreams. We usually trained in small cells. and. Between the ages of six and 10, normally we were trained at night. We were picked up and we were brought to a mall, an indoor mall where you normally go shopping. It would be shut down and there would be reptilians there, there would be different uh, groups there that would be observing the training that would go on. And different cells of children would be pitted against each other in these competitions. So. They had to start somewhere with the children, so they started with a lot of the basic training. We, we learned traditional firearms, field stripping of weapons, blindfolded, by touch. We learned self hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, which was something I was already learning from my grandfather. Wayfinding, you know, um, reading maps and being able to determine where you are and how to get to where you want to be. Calculating objects at a distance for, um, you know, kind of like snipers do, you know, the rule of thumb type of, to tell how far away a human is. And of course, communication protocols for um, 
for radio. Now, you cannot just introduce a person to a non-terrestrial without some sort of acclimation or preparation. In the beginning, we would, the virtual reality scenarios I was mentioning, we would go in, we would walk into a room and there would be like card tables, like you know you play cards at, with military and scientific people sitting around them. And then you would go into your virtual reality training and then when you would come out and as they were walking you back through where you came, you would look over at the table and there would be a great alien sitting there. And that, that was their first little step. They would show, usually they will show you photos uh, to kind of get you your mind ready for it and then they introduce you to these beings in that kind of a manner. They don't want it to be too much of a shock. And if you asked any questions like, what was that? Or, they would just tell you, you didn't have a need to know. So this helped deprogram the fight or flight response that all of us have. Um, it, it can be quite the adrenaline release when uh, you're in front of one of these beings, especially as psychic as some of them are. They're very, some of them are very invasive. And of course, there were hybrid children that were present also during our training. And I have a few disturbing stories about my interactions with them that I, I, I do not make public. So once they develop your, you have the in, intuitive empath abilities, they have a cocktail of chemicals that can enhance those abilities. And when you come off of the chemicals, it is almost like going blind. You lose all of these uh, extra senses. All of your senses are enhanced. But when you're taken off the medication, it's like going blind and deaf to a certain degree. And of course, much of, uh, they believe all evolution occurs through trauma. So much of the training is extremely traumatic, very traumatic. They would put us in sensory deprivation chambers for hours, or you know, you, you lose all sense of time. It seemed like hours. And even in these sensory deprivation chambers, at times they would use virtual reality as well. And you, the out-of-body experiences that, that we had were just epic. Now, a lot of people have heard of the MK Ultra programs, and they associate any type of program like the one that I've been in as being MK Ultra, mind controlled, you know, German mind control. But there are a lot of ultra programs, and very most of them use the mind control. Um, tactics that they learned in MK Ultra, but these other programs have completely other agendas and are only related to MK Ultra by name, the Ultra part. Now, every single person in this room, including myself, is actively under mind control. We have all types of mind controls, socially programmed, religious program, genetically programmed, and um, technology that's interfering with our consciousness. Well, first of all, one of the number one symptoms that children and young uh, teens had, they, a lot of them would have a very nice life at home, a very good home life with their family, but they had unexplained post-traumatic stress disorder. They couldn't explain it. Well. On one level, of course, our subconscious level, we recall all of the trauma-based programming that occurred, but consciously, there's no memory of it. So there's a conflict between, between the conscious and the subconscious that creates all of the symptoms of PTSD. I was actually 15 here, I think, but... Um, at the age of 13 is when we reached the apex of the training. That's when they started giving us the injections. And uh, the, uh, the full dose, when they built up to the full dose, it, 
the jump in your abilities was so dramatic that a lot of people began to get kind of Christ complexes, felt like they were something, you know, bigger or better than everyone else. Um, so that, you know, that, that was a problem. There were a lot of people that, um, yeah, really began to think that they were here to save the, the planet. I was brought to a crystal cavern, much like the one they found in Mexico. We were brought there in a small submarine that went through an underground river. And the underground river, at a certain point, it diverted into this further area we traveled under, and then we popped out into an area to where there were no crystals, it was a cavern, but we were brought back by the people who were stationed there into this um, room to where we prepared. We, we were put in environmental protective suits. Uh, we had all of these uh, different devices on us monitoring our uh, telemetry, you know, heart, brain, neurology. And uh, recently, when I was recounting the story, I recalled a blocked memory of a tall white being being in the middle of all of the children that were in a circle. These crystals, they told us, were alive. They were beings. They had a life force. They wanted us to interface with them and to gather information, but we were told, do not touch them. If you touch them, you can harm the crystal, or, and the crystal could harm us. And when we started to interface with them, an aura of light started to build around the crystals. And the crystals were huge, even bigger than, wider than these. It was very hot, 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, at, um, USB device, human, as children, we were used like a USB device. We went in, we interfaced with the crystals, we gathered all of this information, and then we were debriefed chemically, where they removed all the information, just like we were a common memory stick, and then blank slated us. And then they, that's how they gathered their intelligence. When I was around 13 years old, and I had reached a certain level of ability to interface with non-terrestrials, they brought me and two other children to a federation meeting. This is a very close representation to what that base looked like. It was in the middle of a temporal anomaly outside of Jupiter. You had to enter in and exit the exact same way, or you would get stuck. You could see no stars. You would fly, you'd leave a star field, you would enter this anomaly, and it was pitch black. And there were over 60 different non-terrestrial groups that met in a large portion. It was much like the UN, very much. There would be one to three ETs sitting in, a, in seats, and then there was a horseshoe-type rail in front of them, and then they would have uh, psychic support, intuitive impasse of their own who would sit there and monitor the room, looking for any signs of deception or danger. And when we were sitting there, they did not want us focusing on what was going on. They would give us kind of like iPads, a smart glass pad that you neurologically interfaced with to have us preoccupy our minds while we were doing the intuitive work. And there was no visible technology in these places. It was all consciousness-based, very advanced technology. Now, attendees included the Nordic races, the greys, and the, most of the greys are a programmed life form. Um, you have positive, negative, and indifferent groups that all use these programmed life forms that we call the greys. They were developed by an insectoid race way before humans were even on the planet, and it's become like a, a standard hardware for different beings to use, a biological machine. Now, the reason they had three intuitive impasse was that if one picked up on a um, 
possible issue, it, they needed the two others to triangulate to verify that it was a threat because you would get a lot of false positives at times based on your own emotions of being in a situation. And of course our different belief systems played into and filtered the information that was coming through so it was always good to have three different perspectives. Uh, normally the three people would not be from the same culture or speak the same languages and it helped them get a better triangulation. Now, according a lot of the information and one of the biggest problems we have in science is that they focus on the numbers and the tangible and they do not consider the esoteric like we do. During World War II, the Germans did not have that problem. They married science and the esoteric and the results were phenomenal. In, in the early 30s, they were flying around in anti-gravity devices. All of, in, from the glass pads, all of these different esoteric negative groups had a different belief system or religion about what was to occur in what we're calling the ascension. And they had completely differing ideas on consciousness and how it was developing. So in these negative Illuminati groups, there's not a consensus on their belief systems. There are various belief systems, some very pragmatic, very scientific, some very esoteric, and very just even more out there than people call us. Now, at one, there was an ancient builder race that was here two billion years ago in our solar system. And our local star cluster of 52 stars, they had developed out all of those star systems and put a protective grid around it to keep out what we've referred to as the genetic farmer races that come in and start doing all of these different experiments. And they kept the local 52 stars very safe for many, many, many millennia, even over a billion years. But the pre-Adamites on Mars and Tiamat had a civil war and they utilized the technology of this protective grid against each other and they accidentally brought down the entire grid. And when they did that, all of these genetic farmer races that had really wanted to come in and get this fresh genetic stock, just they moved in and, and took over. This is our local star cluster. You'll see Sol the sun, right there in the middle. A very coveted position. Just outside of our solar system is what they call a supergate. We've heard portals described here, and those are point-to-point -point transfers. A supergate can transfer you to any planet within this galaxy and to with any galaxy. They're all connected with an electromagnetic filament that we call uh, the cosmic web. Now, when these genetic farmer groups moved in, they started over 22 different genetic experiments here. And these experiments are not just genetic. They're about ascension. And all of them have different agendas for ascension. All of these different groups, they compete. These programs compete. And they are a spiritual and genetic ascension program. A lot of these groups, they've brought us religions, different belief systems to help our consciousness expand. And they will tinker with our genetics to cause us to advance genetically. And then this vessel is better able to support the consciousness that they're trying to expand. So these two go together. 65 million years ago, According to the reptilians, this planet was theirs. They believed it was theirs. They had an experiment, a genetic experiment. There's just not, a, not only a mammalian experiment going out there on different stars. There are insectoid experiments. There are uh, reptilian, there are, you name it. And the reptilians supposedly had three races 
of humanoids here on Earth that were destroyed in the cleansing, uh, genetic cleansing that occurred by these human, more human-like ET races that came in. They cleaned the Earth of the uh, reptilian experiment and started a mammalian experiment, which is highly against um, uh, cosmic law on one degree, but um, they began to do this because the reptilian experiments were just uh, going uh, crazy. There were just too many of them. The reptilians often discuss that there were three lost races. Interestingly enough, on Gaia TV, they discovered this three-fingered mummy in Nazca, have you all heard of that? Well, I've seen some of the information on the genetic uh, res test results. Now, if we were to find an ET body and test it, would any of you be surprised that 97% of that DNA matches ours? It's not because they're from here, it's because we're from there. We've been genetically engineered and spliced with all of these different beings' DNA as a part of this experiment. Now, all of you have heard about the Hopi stories, about how the ant people took humans down into inner earth during the last cataclysm and then brought them back out afterwards. Well, apparently the reptilians did the same thing. They removed certain species from the surface and brought them underground. They developed into the raptor race, and there are uh, some of them that are like little dogs. There, there are many different types of species of them. And they're primarily in South and Central America. They are uh, some, they, they have on the, on the back of their heads, they have a plume of colorful feathers, and they're very, they're not really, they're, they're kind of a mix between reptilians and birds, and they have real jerky movements, like a bird, you know, their heads are just real jerky, not, nothing smooth, and they are, they've been seen quite a bit coming out in uh, Central South America at night to hunt, and they are carnivorous. They Millennia ago, they took over a lot of these crystal caves that I had discussed because of the importance it is to this mammalian group of uh, uh, genetic farmers, the 22 genetic experiments. And of course, the insectoids are extremely involved. Uh, most of the technology of the insectoids is not what we would call technology. They will genetically build out, genetically build ships, genetically build drones and workers to do, to do their bidding. And they, they use that type of technology more than they do what we consider technology. And of course, our local star cluster serves as a, as a host to these programs. And I already mentioned most of this, that these programs are in competition with each other. And they terraform, they bring different plants and animals from different planets, slightly modify them genetically for the new environments. So the programs are made up of these components. There's a genetic component, which I described, where they, they tinker with our DNA to evolve us a few percent every 5,000 years. The consciousness component and the spiritual component are pretty, pretty related but they need our consciousness to grow at the same time that they're uh, advancing our genetics. Now, of course, some of the competing programs are trying to suppress our consciousness and to interfere with the genetic program. And, of course, the cosmic component is the most important. It's like a giant clock. They travel around from planet to planet as our solar system is rotating around the galaxy, going like this, around the galaxy. And every once in a while, 
we come through this one highly energetic, uh, like gaseous part of the um, of the universe as we go through. And it was there was a a cl cluster of stars that exploded there and changed um, the energetics. So, and that is where these a lot of these cosmic energies. Um, where we, we travel through them and our, and our uh, solar system is e revolving and it's like a dynamo as it goes through these energies it's, it's friction the friction is building up the energy the energy goes around up into the north and south pole of the sun and comes out from the sun that's how the sun actually works it's, an electric, it's like a light bulb now I think we've seen some, we're supposed to be in solar minimum, but we've seen some very interesting activity with the sun recently, have we not? And all of that is tied to the energetic weather that is occurring and the earthquakes. These are all things that the Blue Avians told me that were going to happen, and I discussed six months ago in Cosmic Disclosure. And now we're watching it happen before us. We understand the concept of star seeds, you know, uh, ET souls incarnating here. Now, what's very bizarre is that a lot of people, they think these, this group of people is being abducted by non-terrestrials. Isn't that against cosmic law? Isn't that against their free will? Yes, it is. A way around this, the, the benevolent and malevolent, good and bad, uh, non-terrestrial races are very good at skirting or getting around these cosmic laws. And one of the ways they do that is they will incarnate here as us, forget who and what they are, and then agree to be a part of these experiments. I was first brought into the programs. I was involved in what they called the in, uh, Intruder, Intercept, and Interrogation Program. From our perspective, there was one group that had come in and abducted humans and returned them back to their previous location dead and our military forces were like these are evil beings we need to find out what's going on and eventually they were able to capture some of them and it turned out good and bad is perspective these beings thousands of years ago had had a crew that crashed on our planet and the beings in that ship got caught up in our incarnation cycle so it was a rescue mission, and, and from their point of view, it was a rescue mission. From our point of view, humans were being killed. So how do we bridge that gap? That's very, very difficult if you think about it. And of course, it's the, the natural law loophole that they use by uh, reincarnating here as humans. Now, because they are these 22 genetic programs are in competition, often they will abduct the experiments of another group to gather intel or to also try to pollute or to mess up the experiment of uh, the opposing group. Now, how is the experiment contained? Well, we are the zookeepers of our own, we're, we're our own prison keepers. They program us through speaking different languages to keep us separate. Different races were programmed through religions, social conditioning, not to interbreed with each other. It goes way back. You know, many remember in the Bible, uh, the Israelis were told to go in and kill everybody from the opposing races. Well, this has, this goes back to the genetic experiments where they did not want any cross contamination between experiments. And they use geographical locations, obviously, to separate them so they would not come together. But they've always divided, divided us. And of course, there's, they're, they're constantly at almost, not war, but conflict with each other with these experiments. And it's, a, a major, it's been a major struggle to keep their experiments pure, especially after this pre-Adamite group that once lived on Mars and Tiamat, they, after they, their, uh, the planet exploded, they moved to the moon, and that was their base for a long time. And then 
um, they were attacked again and had to come down to Earth. And that was about 60,000 years ago. And they really started to mess up a lot of the genetic experiments that were going on. They went crazy uh, making chimera, mixing humans with animals, their DNA with humans, all of it. All of it. Now, the long-term program, all of the ETs out there were once experiments. They started off very uh, raw and rudimentary. Their genetics were enhanced. Their consciousness was enhanced to a point to where they became self-managing. Now most of these groups determine when they need a genetic upgrade, when they need a change in consciousness. And they become, one of the steps is that you become a uh, interstellar species. Okay. So what is remote viewing? Remote viewing has been, I guess, we've been remote viewing for ever since the species has been on the planet. You know, when, um, you know, we've had shaman that would do techniques that were basically the same as remote viewing. When, when is, does the history of remote viewing begin with you? When the f first man walked the planet. Right. And animals remote view, most animals anyway, remote view naturally anyway. Right. If you ever had a dog or a cat or work with them or see a natural disaster about to happen, you see all the animals walking up the hill and stopping right at the place where they should stop and nothing happens to them. Like in the tsunami in, um, in uh, Phuket. Um, it's a, it's a natural ability. It all has to do with the, the connection being open fully to your subconscious or being uh, reduced so that you don't realize that you have a subconscious that operates. Yeah, a lot of people would think that remote viewing didn't exist until we scientifically broke down the process you're describing right. and assigned protocols to it. Correct. Right. And there are a number of different types of remote viewing as well. Sure. Can, can, you, can you describe the different types? Um, there, there is uh, the one that I talked about going within, they call this like, it's, it's like free-flowing extended remote viewing, which is the one that's most used. It was originated uh, mainly in, in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and then it came to the U.S. And then in the U.S. they started doing protocols where they were more uh, amenable to uh, the military here because of their mentality where they wanted fast results without altering uh, consciousness. And it worked, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's more of a, you know, idiom, idiom uh, motor uh, responses where you, you, and it was based on also on certain techniques that were taught by a, a, a sect, a religion sect, uh, that was teaching something, the Titans. I know you know what I'm talking about. Right, and it's no surprise that uh, the military was going to try to weaponize right. a well, natural no. ability. How could the military not want to weaponize something? <laughs> That's not going to happen, at least not right now. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, so of course they, they tried to, to, uh, to weaponize it, to the point that they even tried to use it for uh, you know, influencing people's health and and, and mentations and uh, the ability to, uh, to make decisions and try to imp imp implement thoughts in other people. But he was used also for when, when, you know, signal intelligence wasn't as powerful as it is right now and there were not drones on every corner and, uh, and you didn't carry your, uh, your chip, which I called the iPhone, the iPhone, the Google, you know, they're watching you right. <laughs> all day long. Listening. Yeah, listening and watching. Uh, before that, they, uh, when they needed in information, they would very often turn to remote viewers. It was not 100% effective, because nothing can be 100% effective when you're dealing with, and I can explain why when you get into those realms, because you can be touching some parallel timelines that are not necessarily exactly the same timelines as you have. Um, but there are ways of, of, of being quite effective. I would say the effectiveness of remote viewing right now, at least in the teams that we still have now in my, my operation, is about 70 to 80 percent. That's, that's pretty high. Yeah. This, is everyone hearing us okay? Can you hear yeah. me? Okay. Is that better now? Oh, I'm sorry. 
I really apologize. <laughs> Will you forgive my accent too? Yeah. Can anybody remote you what accent that is? Okay. No, French is correct. <laughs> you got it. All right. Okay. So, what is the difference between remote influencing and remote viewing? Okay. I don't know who coined remote influencing. As far as I remember, when I wrote in 1996 and 1997, it became public. I revealed how to do remote viewing. I started talking about remote influencing. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of the remote viewers who had just been decommissioned by the CIA or the DIA said, we don't do these things, of course. Uh, there is no remote influencing. And, so, and, and then finally it became a very big uh, subject matter and a lot of people became, uh, started teaching what they, they in, 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 their, in their schools also called remote influencing. So remote influencing is really the same thing, though. What we were teaching is bringing, you know, your mind is at all times connected to the mind of the creator. There is, the only thing that exists in creation is thought, to sit. The basis of creation is not light, it's not sound, it's thought. The, the, the creator is infinite intelligence and pure thought, meaning it's not restricted. So it doesn't have to restrict itself in the system, or mechanical apparatus, or a, or a linear type of thinking. He can think sideways at, as far as he wants, and these cars, if it's a little bit like a, a, a billion times uh, uh, more powerful than, than our artificial intelligence machine would be, it's, it's, it's pure intelligence, unrestricted. So in order for the creator to experience itself in different manifestations, be they, for ourselves in the 3D world as animals, humans, and, and everything else, he will create systems of thought that would then be translated into the ability to, to for me and you to, to talk through, uh, to the sound of waves, we think is air, and, and he will block the ability to communicate from me and you uh, automatically to our subconscious, because our subconscious are really connected. What people call intuition is really a connection at the level of the subconscious. And the level of the subconscious is really the level of your soul. There is, you know, so mind, soul, i.e. spirit, and the creator are not disconnected. We're just the parts of the creator that are here to experiment and interact in this multifaceted game or lattice, if you want, that we call creation. So the reason why we cannot uh, be telepathic or know, so to speak, the future, it was done on purpose so that we walk blindly the earth because originally man was able to do so, the so-called Garden of Eden. He was able to see the whole, what's, what, the good path, the bad path, and then the creator realized that most probably this would be a lack of experience for the creator because they would always choose the best path in advance knowing what the path would be, so he restricted mankind. But nevertheless, he gave man the ability to regain this, ability, this, this, this natural ability by showing characteristics that would align itself with the Creator. And if those characteristics will be shown, you will be welcome back to go back to the, its original state. Yeah, it's amazing how the um, scientific community would state that remote influencing doesn't exist when the scientific community has documented the observer effect and how observing a, uh, an, an experiment, by observing it, you can affect the outcome of that experiment. Not only that, the only way you're going to uh, not only affect an experiment, the only, only way anything is going to happen in front of you is if you observe it. Right. I mean, quantum physics right now is getting to the point where they use electrons, they use, uh, but not only photons, and they, they, do, they do all kind of experiments where they realize that there is no real future, there is no past, that there is retro, retro, uh, retro uh, uh, causation, meaning that when you see something, it's your act of observation that creates the reality. It's, and they used to only talk about probability functions that collapse at that point. 
but they realize that the moment you see something, and I, can, I could go on for hours explaining quantum physics, but we don't have time for that. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's like in the ma movie Matrix, when we ask Neo, you know, Neo is going to see the, uh, the oracle, and then this kid is there watching a spoon, and the spoon is bending, and Neo goes, well, that's interesting. And he says, uh, how do you, did you bend the spoon? He says, if you think that the spoon is outside of you and I'm bending the spoon, that's impossible. If you think the spoon is inside of you, which it is, by the way, because there's nothing outside of you, I'm just bending my mind. I'm bending that reality that I'm projecting out. And then the spoon bends. So you can bend spoon, but you can do much more than bending spoon. You can bend reality, you can bend people's desires. You can, you can make the world a magnificent place. We are basically, we don't realize, but we are not just tiny parts of the creator. We are restricted for our learning purposes until we develop a conscience, not the consciousness, a conscience that's high enough to be brought back up towards and invited in the family of the creator. And we remain alive with the creator because we are really then the many within the one. So when we are ready, we will be able to bend the spoon, bend reality and create reality as the creator does. And it's within us, we carry that mechanism within us, in our biology. And just as we're... And mine especially. Yeah. And just as remote viewing is a natural ability, so is remote influencing. We're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're, effect, we're affecting the co-creative consciousness. So, you know, all we need are, are a few protocols to learn how to become more effective. Um, now, you mentioned something that uh, we could bend people's wills uh, and, and that kind of a thing. Um, you know, there is no spoon. Um, do we violate other people's free will when we remote influence? That's a very, an excellent question. Um, okay, I'll tell you, at the level of the co-creators, because there are higher levels than us, which are part of what we consider to be our soul, but our soul is a multi-dimensional multi level too. And it's not an entity, it's a, a superimposition of states. Rooted that connects to a higher set, each soul, yeah. yeah. Because if we are disconnected from our soul, we wouldn't exist. We would just literally, you would evaporate in front of me or I would evaporate, it wouldn't exist. So the, there has to be that connection. To the, to the source. So from the source, you go down lower and lower, and that accumulation, that, that, that circuitry that finalizes itself to the final product, which is I, you, and all these people here, which are magnificent when you think of it. It's an incredible thing to watch a human being, or to watch a, this creation. It's not something to, to discard and say, okay, next. Because this is, this is the ultimate creation for the creator, this ability to create separation to such an extent that we forget who we are. That's, at the level of the creator, this is an extremely exciting thing because he himself can lose himself in his own dream and start to worry about, yeah. <laughs> about regaining control. You understand? I do. So, go ahead. So, as we learn to uh, have a greater effect on the co-creative consciousness, yeah. Is there a responsibility that comes with that? Yeah, a responsibility to your fellow man and of course. their free will? We are constantly influencing each other whether we don't know it or not. When you go into a room and you're in a bad mood, for whatever the reasons are, and lately there are a lot of reasons that have nothing to do with you because there are just energies infiltrating. There's a whole phenomena now because we it's are language shifting. Language itself. Language uh, itself is a manipulation. You're trying to convince someone else of your... Exactly. That, right. So you just... We are here to influence each other. It's not, it's, it's not illegal. It's, it's necessary. We are not to be not influencing each other, but hopefully we will influence each other for the better, to help the other, to share with the other, to be loving towards the other. Because in that process, you're helping yourself. So the, this is the difference between, yes, you should influence. Now, if you want to impose, that, which is different, and that can be done, and I'm not going to say how it's been done, not at our level really, but on the higher levels, that game is played where they try to impose. That is a no-no, but as a, anything you tell a child not to do, you know what he's gonna do, uh, most probably what he's not supposed to do. So they, 
this is a, a it's, it's become a serious problem at the level of, of what some people perceive higher creators or extraterrestrials and so forth. They come in and they start you know, playing with our minds. I won't even talk about what's going on in the governmental levels, which is, uh, they literally almost fry your brain to try to implement, you know, to, uh, to put thoughts in it. What is the difference between, you know, a lot, some people spend a lot of time daydreaming, mm -hmm. and uh, is that a type of meditation? What is the difference between daydreaming, meditation, dreaming, and prayer? Well, it depends how you pray. You know, if you pray with full conviction because you believe in, in how you pray or the name that you invoke or whatever that is, or you've seen the power of prayer and then there is a positive reinforcement that this will be achieved, you are really influencing reality. You're bringing that future that's not there yet in manifested format, but that's been created and you're gonna meet it. And the moment you meet it, you're gonna have the present moment of living it. That future is being prepared to you because you're energizing that particular future. There are many futures that you could choose from, but by doing this, you're bringing this to you. It's, it's like a placebo effect on, on steroids. If you really, you, so that's what prayer is. It's really influencing reality. The mechanism is always the same. And if you do it just because you, you, don't, you don't pray to a deity, but you pray because you understand the process and you understand that you are part of the deity, which hopefully everybody will soon, then uh, you, will, you, will man you will bring that, that future that's been created by your higher self to you, and then you two will, mar will marry together, and then this will manifest itself, concretize itself in this perception of reality, we have what we call the dream of creation here. Yeah, yeah I, th I think a lot of people, just on meditation, there's, they put too much mystery into it, but as I've stated, when you've sat in a deep state of thought or daydreaming, that's no different than meditating. No. And taking, learning to obtain those deeper states of consciousness help you to not only meditate on a deeper level, but you become, you get closer and closer to, have, to being able to wield that remote influencing ability and the remote viewing ability as well. Right. If you think in terms of having an ability, you have it already. Right. Just you has know? to be fine-tuned. Yeah, just watch a little baby when he's born, he starts screaming and he wants food. He has the ability to influence reality from the moment he comes out. <laughs> That's it. I've we all have that, this ability. Yeah. So we, we are meant to have this ability. The question is, what do we do with this ability? That's, not a, que that's a question we can only answer. And as people become more powerful in the way by which they're going to influence reality, including using their, you know, their, their so to speak, mech, you know, the car and their, their vehicle, their, their biological vehicle and, and the activity that they can do during the day, uh, it's, it's the quality that's more important than the quantity. So the quality of your influence is really capital. I, but I, it's, it's, it's there. Now there are, we teach techniques because you said that. It's funny when you said that. It's like when people ask me, what's the difference between meditation and uh, this and that? And I said, I, they say, I cannot meditate. I cannot go into hypnosis. And I said, really? And I said, have you watched a movie? And they go, yeah. I said, well, if I put a, an EEG to your brain, you'd be probably into deep alpha. I do that right. in a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. And that's where they use that state in movies to plant seeds into our co-creative right. consciousness and use it against us. Um, because I w I, I'm, I'm curious, you've been doing this for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had, because this is, this is really dangerous information. They try to keep the observer effect secret. They don't want us to know the power of our co-creative consciousness because they want us to stay there in a and state slave. of being asleep slave. so they can manipulate yeah. it. Yeah. Have you ever, from delivering this information, have you ever had opposition? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> stupid question. <laughs> no, no, because no. if I were to tell you what happened to me, and I have some people that have known me for a while out here, um, it would beat the best uh, movie, uh, science fiction movie, that, uh, in, a, in a sad way, though. Yes, of course. 
I can relate. Yeah, from many levels, including some levels that are not human, you know, because they don't want that information out at all. No, this is dangerous information. It's to, very if, dangerous. If you're and the control much system. more sophisticated than our military by far. Right. So I could write like books on that. But I always believe that if you stay aligned with the one, really aligned in your heart with the one, you protect it. And I've, this has been proven to me many times, including recently when somebody really tried to get rid of me and, and put some drugs in a, in, in a drink. And where I, I, when I opened my eyes, which I was not supposed to be a minute later, but like 10 minutes later, that person was strangling me and I, I laughed. Because it was not even me, it was my higher self laughing, going, you think it's going to work? And, and just kicked her out and left. But the, um, those things happen all the time. I heard that there was a problem with, uh, with uh, Wilcock, right? With an accident uh, yesterday? An, an, yeah, right. uh, an apparent attempt. Yeah, I had yeah. that too many years. They teleported my car, literally. They, te they moved it around like, as, a, as a warning, and I went... I took my car, but I, I had a major problem because it was accelerated from 40 miles an hour to about 150, suddenly jumped off in the middle lane. I find myself, I knew I, I, was, I was dying. I, was, I saw the cars coming, and then I lost consciousness, found myself in the ditch across, and then they had to send, uh, at, that, at that point in Mitsubishi, it was 2001, before 9-11, like three months before, and, uh, and they sent the head um, um, of security, uh, you know, a technical service of Mitsubishi from the southeast, from Georgia. I came down for four weeks trying to understand how come a new car had a flywheel that was broken in the middle, mm -hmm. and which is really almost impossible. So, um, but I was there, and you know, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm not did. planning on leaving until I'm finished doing what I'm doing, and then we're going to go to a nice place together. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, people. Don't realize how dangerous an idea can be. No. Yeah. The, the real war is a war of ideas. The world is a world of ideas. There's nothing else but thought and ideas. You change the world by changing the ideas the people believe in. That's it. As long as they keep repeating the same old ideas and, and stay in their old programming and, 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 and stay there, they're going to repeat history. Why are they repeating history? Because they, they bring the same seed idea and then they create their reality around it. They don't realize they're creating this. Right. So the, the study of history should be a, a, a study where you learn from it, but not a study where you, you're fascinated by it and then you make tons and tons of movies, you know, showing battles and then more battles and then more glory and, and then because we, we're never going to get out of this, this infernal cycle. So we have to to stop. I don't know how you tell people stop. I don't care. Like one day, two days, and just erase everything that you've been taught is true, and just connect in inside because the truth is inside of you. You carry it. You were born with it. You know, just take all the all the stuff out and then go to the the basic truth, not of what you have become, because that's kind of obvious. We're all reflecting each other, and that's who we have become but who you are, and who you are is you really the creator. You know, having, having gotten a, a major case of uh, blindness and, and schizophrenia at the end. Well, he's having schizophrenia because he thinks he's, he's everybody, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, remote viewing in general, yeah. these techniques are, uh, all the different types of remote viewing, are they all based on military or intelligence programs? The ones that call themselves remote viewers, most of them are. Um, yeah, they, they, they've been burdened, but there's, there's nothing incredible as, as far as the ability to do Anybody can do it. It has nothing to right. do with IQ. It has nothing to do with the amount of money that you have. It's, just, it's something you're born with. People that do a lot of nature tracking have this instinctive ability to perceive you know, the track in advance, who, who was there, and they can sense it. Uh, animals have it, they don't lose it. So what we, we teach people is to go at the level, and you took our course, and you, you, you remember taking the course, we teach people to go for remote viewing at the border of sleep, which is called theta. That's the level you have at night, just before going to sleep, when you have this hypnagogic imagery for a little while, and then you go into the, the level of sleep. The reason we do this is because 
we have good reasons to prove, we can prove that, that when you go to sleep in reality, you go to the level of your subconscious, unconscious, the universal conscious mind. We are all connected at that level. And your soul, you reconnect to your soul. And your soul, at the level of the soul, is connected to the, all the other souls it connects to, which goes very far and influences far more than we can even dream. Sorry? This one? No, I... Okay. And uh, so we will bring you to the level of theta and we try to stabilize you. Theta in the, le in the Greek letter shows two, it's like, it's like an oval with a sign in the middle. It's like having one foot in the outer, so to speak, uh, reality and one foot in the inner reality. And you're supposed to operate with hopefully you will constantly operate, not only when you meditate, because people say, oh, let's go meditate and let's do some remote viewing. That's not the way you should be. You should be constantly with one foot in the inner world, which is infinite. The real infinity is inside, it's not outside. You know, the, the, we think of the universe outside as being infinite. You can see it and travel and travel and never see the end of it, but that's gonna be projected to you. The real infinity is inside of you. And the, uh, so you have one foot within the inside that you monitor your thoughts, and then in the, other, the other foot is on the outer, and then you finally get to a point where you constantly realize that your whole thoughts, everything you think about, and that you truly believe in, are being mirrored across in the reality that you, uh, you then experience. And then you are not the one projecting that reality, it's projected for you through your senses. So what you perceive outside as being beautiful light is in reality happening through the brain inside. Yeah. And there is like no an light. There is no light in the it. brain. Yeah. Sorry? You're, you become, you're like an antenna for yes. consciousness. Yeah, you're an antenna for consciousness and you're a point of light for the creator. He, you're an important point of perspective. He has all the perspective of himself through all the points of light that we all are. He can see himself. In, in this way, in that way, and he can, he's basically interacting with it, it, itself through us. Do you understand? I do. Right. But, and I was just thinking that even though, you know, remote viewing is and uh, remotely influencing the co-creative consciousness is a natural ability that we have, but we can develop those abilities by co-opting the uh, I guess, weapons that are used against us. Um, we can uh, use um, remote viewing protocols that were developed for war, and we can, through our intent of being service to others, we can take those protocols, enhance our innate abilities to try to influence this co-creative consciousness for the betterment of, of the rest of humanity. Not only we can, we should. Yes. I, I, I'm not going to say something because, it's, you know, it's, 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 I'm trying to promote anything here. If man right now does not go within much more and let's go of all the programs that tell them how to do it and, and just reads about it or just watches things about it but doesn't do it, uh, there is a very serious possibility that we're not going to be able to continue as a creation period. Not because the creator is, is, is angry or judgmental, because that's not at all the case. It's impossible for it because we are his own children. It's just because of the amount of conflicts that are arising right now between humanity and the separation that we don't know how to handle it. If we don't turn within and realize and experience within strongly that we are all connected, and we stop the madness for a little while at least, uh, we're going to have a major problem. And people don't realize that every single Ill ailment, you know, ailment uh, that, that we have as humanity, whether it's a disease, whether it's major problems in relationships, whether it's uh, the inability to, to be happy, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the dysfunctional family, the dysfunctional society, the anger, the, 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 the idea of judging everybody from the exterior instead of watching the interior because they're unable to feel the interior of that person. <coughs> All the dysfunctionality can be easily healed the moment you shift. We have done incredible healings in our, in our, in our group. I mean, things that would, would, in the old times, would be considered to be uh, totally miraculous. 
I mean, really totally miraculous. And this, this is constant. And the people that are doing it are not the holiest people on earth. They just understood and li are living this principle right now. And through the living it, being it, expressing it, they, they just they manipulate the reality in order to help their families, in order to help others, in order to, to do all this. And you know, maybe you know, doctors won't like it, but it's the way it is. Um, <clears throat> are there, you know, we've, we've heard the stories about you know, the men staring at goats, trying to kill a goat with their thoughts, stopping yeah. a heart or causing a, um, an embolism or something like that. Are there other ways that uh, remote viewing, remote influencing that you know of are used in these unacknowledged programs that we would be unaware of? Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of it personally. I know they, they were using it here, especially, if, you know, trying to mess with this. I don't know how if efficient that would be, I can only say that, yes, you probably can do these things. You don't have to look at the remote viewers. You look at the black magicians, they do this all the time. Mm -hmm. But it takes also two to tango. The, the person that is being applied a certain uh, negative energy, if you want a bad spell, and then you, you're trying to do something to it, usually you realize that if they have the fear, if they, if they just catch that element of fear, they are seriously at risk, but if they are able to stay in a state where they do not espouse fear, because fear is not natural, it's not godly. It's a, it's a reaction for, in, in front of the unknown and not knowing how to react, and then you seem to, to either react aggressively or you just you're locking into a shell. If you, if, you have this, if you don't have this fear, you're fine. So my answer is yes. If you're asking me on higher levels, levels that you've experienced, if they can do certain things, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see, I had a question here, but I just lost it, but I guess we'll move on. Um, what, what is a collective consciousness? Is it the same as source? Is it something a little mm -hmm. different? Um, it, it has many levels. You could call, imagine, it's a node of consciousness. If, if you have five people connected to a same node of consciousness, let's say, okay, and then there are branches, and then there's you, and then there's your son, and then the daughter, and then they're all connected. It forms one node of collective consciousness. If you talk about the, com the, the global consciousness of mankind, that's another node. And that's already a very highly creative node that it connects every single human being on, on this planet. If you talk about a universal consciousness, then you're talking about a whole universe. And that continues to multiply, because there are many, many universes operating parallelly in different realities to ours. So they're, they're all gigantic nodes of operations, of creators. These are real creators are, are operating, handling, controlling their creations, and, and hoping for a better outcome. There's not a creator in the world that wants a bad outcome. There's a problem is certain creators, certain energies, if you want, are afraid of losing uh, us as humans because they basically have gotten used to use us as batteries, as energy, because we have divine energy yeah. and they don't. Right. They, in fact, they are really artificial. It's like we are playing with computers. There are some creators that are played with artificial types of creators and they've lost their ability to create their own energy so they just suck it out from, from us. So they try to divert us and, and confuse us all along with stories, especially scary stories and, and stories that put us in a state of increased, incredible stress so that we barely have time because it's, even though time is relative or you can even say it doesn't exist, we only live the present. We don't have time to, to go within and, and do this. That's why we have so many people right now, I would advise them instead of watching their iPhone and eating from the apple of the tree of good and evil, you know, at night to relax, I would watch a movie that shows battlefields and so because it stays in the mind. Every time you watch a battlefield movie, the mind has no knowledge of future past, whether it's real or not. It takes it in as if you went through this and it changes you and changes the field around you. You're first your family and then your city and then your country and then the whole planet. 
So we're not doing ourselves a favor doing this. It also kind of reminds me of what uh, I was told that, uh, you know, all of us want to change the world, but if we start practicing these types of uh, methods, then we are changing the world one, one person at a time. Yes. And through our example. And the, there's not going to be a savior coming from anywhere else saving us. We have to be the saviors, each and every one of us. We have to do it. And we can. It's so easy. Yeah. First, we have to overcome our programming. And the programming is on many different levels. We socially program each other every day. You know, that is not a social norm. That is not right. You're going against that. You know, we've been programmed to shepherd ourselves. Once we get past that programming to realize that, yes, we can get off our knees, then we'll realize that inwardly, you know, all the answers are inwardly. And um, once we do that, then we're no longer slaves. Yeah. yeah. It was, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How do our daily thoughts, concerns, fears contribute to this co-creative consciousness? How does it affect the co-creative consciousness? The, the co-creative consciousness is, uh, i give you an example. When we do remote influencing, when we teach you remote influencing, we teach you how to go into the sleep state, which is in, in Greek is the letter delta. It's called the delta state. It's from one CPS, to four. Your brain is vibrating between one times per second to four. If you're at zero, you're not here anymore. So at one to four, you're in delta. At that level, there is no dreaming possible. And people thought, well, the, you know, even though we spend at least a third to a half of our day, depending if people like to sleep or not, uh, being asleep, why would the creator create that state and then have us stay there doing basically nothing. Well, we're not really doing nothing. We are in touch with a creative state and the creator at that point. So you can, we, re, we can teach you how to remain totally lucid while you're sleeping. You may hear yourself snoring. You may decide to leave your body and do some high work. So say it's very advanced lucid dreaming. Because in reality, we're all dreaming. As I'm talking to you, we're in the middle of a joint dream. This is, this is a dream that we're having together. But lucid dreaming is when you take back control over your reality. And at that point, you can inject thoughts at the level of the creator who is totally neutral. And you take back your control over your creation. You can protect yourself. You can protect your family. This is remote influencing on a very, very high level. Now, so, yeah, now uh, to go back to this, uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Thought can, we know that thought can have an effect on matter, but where does emotion come into play? I've always been told that emotion was sort of a catalyst, an energetic yeah. catalyst to thought. Okay. It, not only does thought have an effect in matter, thought creates matter. There is no matter. It's, right. The illusion of matter is created to the activity of thought. Now, it's not created by you saying, let it be a mountain here, or I want a tower, and it should be immediately. This, is, this happens on different yeah. levals. It's, when I, it's this created level. by consensus, by a large group. By, by consensus, and by, there is literally something you call the matrix or whatever. It's, 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 it's a lattice of operation that the creator made available so that when you input into this lattice, I want this to be manifested, it will manifest. It's like if you're dreaming at night, and then suddenly you find yourself uh, riding a horse uh, somewhere and then having a whole, whole story unfolding. Did you create the horse? How did you go about creating the horse? Who are the other characters living, you know, dreaming with you? Is it you? Well, they are you, yeah, but they're coming from higher levels of you that are playing against you so that you have this impression of a story being played out. So if you're asking me if matter really exists, it matters a lot because otherwise there will be no reality that we would perceive it as such, we wouldn't take it seriously. So it's, it's, it's nevertheless, it's still thought. That's why when you said, bend your mind, you'll bend the spoon, because the spoon is not made out of matter. It's, a, it's a, literally a projection out. We all have a bubble reality that we move around. In. If, if the negative side uses 
fear as a catalyst mm-hmm. to um, cause their plans to come into be through the use of our co-creative consciousness, then I guess love is the, the opposite of fear. So yeah. that is our tool. That is our battery to pull from. Yeah, yeah. The energy that we have to feed in, into these. Uh, the two poles in creation as forces. That's the most important thing to understand. There's a force of the, the, the nature of the creator, which is pure love. It gives life, life, love, and light is, starts with the air. It's basically the same thing. It's gifting, 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 not asking anything in return. So that's true love, unconditional love. You, when you feel that love, which I've felt a couple of times, you'll never forget it because it's, it's, you, you're bathing in this, in this field of, you, you don't want to leave it because it's, you don't even, you get, even in your mother's womb, you couldn't get it for the people I can remember it. It's unbelievable. So the, that love comes down into creation and because of the explosion into perceptions of separation, fear, which is an illusion, because the only, how can you be afraid of who is yourself? You're part of me, I'm part of you. Everybody is part of each other. Ignorance causes fear. Huh? Ignorance of that causes exactly. fear. Exactly. And then, then hatred starts coming in. And from hatred, we go into violence. And then we have principles, and then we have books, and then we have systems. And then everybody's, before you knew it, the, the, you know, it, you, there is a, a, it's a spiral, downward spiral that comes down really fast, and we have to stop it. We can only stop it each man and woman one at a time, especially the children, because they still have the, the most powerful creator in this world are the children, mm-hmm. because their state of belief is immense. So when a child is watching a violent movie as opposed to an adult, and you're saying, no, he's only a child, or he's playing a video game that's violent. You don't realize that that kid has that 100 times more power in creating violence around the world than you have, because for him, this is, he's so engrossed in this reality that he's emotionally attached. His emotion is what gives life to thought. When you, you marry emotions and thought, you create. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. completely. Thank you, that's good. Um, I think we've discussed it a little bit, but how is our co-creative consciousness used against us by those who want to control us? Because they know they know uh, our weak points. They know that we we basically we're not evil. We we lack the the the, the warmth of of the group. Apathy. <laughs> we have apathy to up to a certain extent, but we what. What humanity is really dying of, and I'm serious now, I mean, you take all the diseases you want in, in this allopathic broken system that takes, takes a whole and then looks at all the little parts and then thinks that they operate independently, almost independently of each other. But when you look at humanity and all the diseases that we suffer now, the only reason we suffer of diseases, the only reasons where we suffer of lack we have problems because we lack one thing. It's not money. It's not uh, necessarily a healthy environment. We lack love. And even the most evil person on the planet will be evil because it lacks love. And he would look to form a group that will give him a minimum amount of love because it, it didn't receive it. If you look at all the worst d- dictators and you know the 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 the, 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 the brutes of all brutes in, in our history. They were still, you could always find that as children they lacked love and they didn't get love, they didn't get what they needed. It's the real currency of the universe is love. And there's a major fear of not having love. Right. Yes. And, and if we don't learn to love and forgive ourselves, then we're not ever going to be fully empowered to use these tools that... You know, a lot of us have been spending many years learning to hone certain skills, building up their tool chest, but uh, you know we're we're not going all the way. No, and, no. Yeah, and that, it, has to, it has to go with self, <clears throat> love of self. Yeah, in, in our course, we almost program you to say that if you're not going to use this for loving purposes, it just won't work. And at that point, you are in a very altered state, so your mind is accepting it and it's programmed. So you, you can't use this for 
undesirable purposes. We, we built this in on purpose. Now, <clears throat> I think I've talked a little bit about how I, I had in the programs seen them discuss how they use our co-creative consciousness against us, but use propaganda to do it. You know, movies, the news, mm -hmm. and a lot of the times they will plant a seed, the idea of what they want to occur in your mind. And either at the same time or at a later date, they will do a false flag or, or something that will cause you to f make that come into reality with our emotions. Are there other ways that uh, they use the media and, and other tools against us and our co-creative co consciousness? Okay. It's going to be hard for you to, not you, because I know you will understand, for a lot of people to accept the fact that we are not only are being abused and used and played with, and we're the most important players in the universe because we have a straight connection to the creators. Well, all this, so to speak, archons, titans, whatever you want, uh, those mega, mega forces uh, don't. Uh, what's happening is that they play the chess game. What's important for them is the result of the chess game. And they want in that conflict that's going to be between, because it's a multi-dimensional chess game, that there should be a lot of conflict because they suck that energy. It's much easier for humans to produce emotional energy when they are in despair and in anger than to produce emotional energy when they're in love. It's the wrong type of energy, but they can take that energy and feed upon it and use it. So they create situations where everybody starts hating everybody and they give reasons for everybody to hate everybody. So it's not that one side is right or the other side is left. We have to transcend this and, and start thinking, why is this even happening? Well, they, they, as long as we're hating in each other and fighting each other, right. we won't have the time to realize no. we are one. Right. We, we understand that the reason we are fighting each other and going into all those stories and fighting each other is because they used that energy in that situation in order to solve their problems and keeping us enslaved at this level. So we never have a chance to come back from where we originally came from. They even say it in, in, the, in, in, in old, old mystical things that even the angels are, are jealous of humanity because we came straight from the Creator. We, we endowed with the same quality as the Creator has, which means that basically we could have all the powers that the Creator has are, are in our hands. I and think this group's ready to take that power back. It's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's due time, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And it's free, you know? Yeah. Basically, almost free. You just, you just need to dedicate yourself in doing it and then take it back. And always question when you see something coming at you. What is the best way to defend ourselves against these tools that are used against us uh, to, like, you know, media uh, and other tools that they use to um, guide our co-creative consciousness in, in the wrong way. How do we defend ourselves against that? I, I, I would imagine just being aware is a, is a major part of it. They want you to get upset and, and, and fight them. You know, they're like, they're like the, the, the bully that comes in the road and say, hey, how about a fight, you know? Yeah. Instead of being like water. You know? Right, and then you should do it, and, and, and it's, I'm not saying because of Christianity, it's like, give him the other cheek, which means, doesn't mean that, hey, but, you know, hit me on the other cheek, it means I'm not interested, goodbye. Yeah. So you turn, around, turn away. Show him your other right. cheeks. It doesn't mean that if you, you right. <laughs> turn on your rear. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because that takes courage. It takes a lot of courage to do that. Most people say it takes more courage to oppose and fight now. It takes a lot of courage to be totally calm, smiling, re remaining loving, understanding that that poor entity is lost and saying, I love you anyway, we'll find you. When you, when you, you get back to your senses, we'll talk, but not right now. It's, it's hard to remain that zen all the time. I can tell you, <laughs> recently it's been very hard for me. Very hard, <laughs> yeah, uh, for me too, yeah, I know. Okay, what is... So, <clears throat> what can we do to grab a hold of the rudder and begin I, I, to change the co... How, what do we do 
as one, two, five people in a group, how do we start to uh, navigate to the most optimal temporal reality using the co-creative consciousness? What's, what, how do we do this? First, we make a decision that we, we're going to co-create. That's, uh, that's the first thing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's almost a decision we have to decide. We're going to co-create. And agree and, consensus wise and, on what? Right, on doing. what, exactly. Yeah. And then decide on what. And this, this is a dynamic process, not a static process. It changes as it goes. It keeps on expanding to areas that we probably don't even dream of right now as we realize the impact that we can have. So we start co-creating, which, and we will co-create in a, har harmon a harmonious way. We create, everything in the universe is harmony and sounds. Sounds create light. It's, it's the first thing that existed in the universe when consciousness, as pure thought, started vibrating itself and said, Om. But it was a vibration of consciousness, not a vibration of air. And that created the first light that started coming in, and then all the structures that we could think of coming from that matter, creators, uh, entities are coming from that. So we have to do the same thing. We have to go back to our core, very core, and get that connection back. We all have it, it's not difficult. People think, oh, do I dare? I mean, I'm, I'm just a little nobody and, and I haven't been anointed yet and I'm waiting for a certificate from the university mm -hmm. to tell me that I'm, I'm super PhD and this and, and what would my mother gonna think of my daughter or my, my husband and they're gonna think I'm crazy totally on being knocked out. Mm -hmm. So, the, now, if you, th this isn't the way you should think. Just be, have at least the courage to realize who you are and, and express it. it. Doesn't mean that you have to shout it every day. He said, "Hey, don't talk to me. I'm God." You know, <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, I, I think another good point is that we can develop these skills and all these tools, but if we don't also deal, know thyself, deal with our own karma, then we're not going to be as effective or what we think is being service to others may just be service to self. Yes, because when you're in service to self and you realize the real self is the creator, you're in service to everybody. You cannot right. be in service, choose, uh, I'm just in service for a third of myself and the rest I don't really don't care, yeah. or less. <laughs> or, or every other day. Right. right. Why is this inner work so important right now? dealing with the karma, you know, if we develop all of these tools, that's, that's great. Remote influencing, learning how to uh, meditate on a deeper level to affect the co-creative consciousness, but uh, the inner work, why, why is that so important to the process? Be because the inner work is how you affect the outer world anyway. You can't affect the outer world by deciding, I want more money, I want more this. It's not going to happen. When, when your inner world changes to when you feel you are this and you are that and you're convinced of that, then the reflection across the mirror, which is the outer world, is going to be projected to you. So you, it has, when you stop, we have given up our ability, which was given to us from the first man, to work on our inner world, to understand the kingdom is within. And we, before you knew it, we start thinking that the kingdom was maybe within and then without, and then we will still believed in it, and then we lost it totally. Now it's totally without. That's how we were programmed to give away our sovereignty. Right. We, we gave up the sovereignty because who is the king? We, right. I, you, everybody here is the king. We all are the king. You know, at one point we are the one who is the many. We are all of it. And, and by denying it, or thinking that it's like a mental state to think so, or we're aggressing a, a, a religious state, we are, we are in reality aggressing the, the reality of the one as being one. If you think that God is one, then what, what's wrong in thinking that the many are part of the one? Why would they be outside of, of the one? Of course they're part of the one. Right. We're, we're either all one or we're not all one. There's, exactly. Then, then no God is not one. Then. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Why d does, I mean, we've heard earlier today people asking this question. Um, right now, it seems like everyone is being forced to deal with 
all of the karma, all of the trauma that we've buried deep and uh, swore we would never visit again. Now it's being thrown in our faces. Um, and we see people behaving very strangely in, in the world. I mean, to put it mildly right now, what, uh, what do you think is, is the cause of that? There, there is, you know, they say this type of world starts in chaos and then goes into order and then goes back into chaos and then goes back into order. This is a, this is a type, if I were to speak on a higher level, you know, the, the, the old Bible calls this the, uh, the deluge. We're in the middle of the deluge right now. Not a deluge of water, a deluge of consciousness where all the upper levels are coming down the higher levels, and they're mixing with the lower underworld levels. And this is covering all the consciousness. So we're getting a lot of energies going through us. And then we have to understand, when you wake up in the morning tired or in the middle of the night having this crisis of anxiety, we don't understand why. Or you feel suddenly that some, somebody is dying or something serious is about to happen. And then you don't run to your psychologist because you, next day you may wake up and feeling great. And then you go, oh, this is a beautiful day today, you know, so I, I must have done something good. It's, an, it's a very difficult process because what is in reality happening right now, this creation, this whole creation has not been truly born yet. I know it sounds like I'm totally losing it, right? <laughs> but I'm not, you know? <laughs> That's the only thing I know. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. <laughs> Give me a couple more years. We'll see. <laughs> right. So, you know, the, 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 the famous master Jesus asked, asked him, they went to him, they asked him, tell, tell, tell us, master, when is the end of the world going to come? And he said, have you even gotten to the beginning that you should ask me about the end of the world? And of course, I didn't understand it. A creation goes through a phase, the first stage is called the phase of the evening, you know, when the moon shines, the still is some light, that's when the baby is, is, is inside the womb of the mother and breathing the placenta and then happy and bathing and taking care of and everything is fine. And then there is this birth process through the canal and that's the night and that's really difficult and very, as a matter of fact, if you, if you, if you do some hypnotic regression on, on any one of us and then you, you, you bring them to that state, it's the most traumatizing state you can think of. It's like of. your original trauma. This, the the original life. trauma is, is incredible because you're being pushed around, you don't know where you're going, you don't know, the, you didn't see the light yet because you're used to being in darkness and everything is fine and you're to take, taken care of. And you suddenly realize you have to take responsibilities, you're going to be disconnected from your mother and you're going to be an individual being alone, you think alone, in reality you're not because your father is waiting for you and your mother is still there, but you don't know. So this whole creation is about now, after having been prepared for so long by the Creator, is coming out. The problem is that there are a lot of entities here who don't get that, for, of course not, but there are also entities who have an interest in us staying, fighting this whole process. So the baby is breaching, is coming out in a bridge position, and is almost not accepting the light that's waiting, this glorious light, which is the real, real creation, the beginning of a true creation, where then all, you have no idea what, what can be achieved there, because I've been there. I mean, and this is like, you, you, you're not going to ask about remote viewing or remote influencing because it's like beyond, beyond this at that point. But we have to cooperate right now, and we have to understand and experience the oneness between us so that we bring everyone into this, this aura, this atmosphere of harmony, and then we turn back, and we're not afraid of, of How should we be afraid of the light? We come from the light. We are we birthed by it. We're going to go back to the light. We don't die. We live for almost for eternity. So we have to turn around. It's like the story of Plato, you know, the cave, the cave of Plato, mm -hmm. Pla the, the Greek philosopher. He's talking about this cave and people are watching a wall and there are uh, 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 shadows that they're watching on the wall. They're fascinated by the shadows on the wall. And behind them is an opening. It's, they're free to get out. And there's this beautiful, magnificent light and scenery and they're all sitting there watching, they're giving their back to the light and they're watching the shadows. I think it's time for us to let go of the shadows. We, we had enough. We paid our price, we're all worn out, worn out to the bones, really. And we've, we fought a, you know, a, a, a great fight. I think we should just all uni unify, turn around and let the, the light, the, the process itself. 
be in the flow and then we're going to go get out of a, as a creation. This creation will be born and it will be a beginning to it. Yeah. I'm definitely done with this density. <laughs> Yeah, this is an easy one for you. Um, how can we better handle painful situations with family, jobs, partners? Um, you know, that's more of a, I guess, it's going back to dealing with, your, uh, with yourself because usually you're projecting on, onto others. What do you think is the best way to begin to process a lot of this trauma and pain? I know that through your course, a lot of people have reported that they've been able to process traumas. What is it about the process um, that allows them to, to do that? It's, it's multiple. First of all, they, they start experiencing the sense of unity and they sense others. It's not like necessarily that they, they, they're constantly reading their thoughts, but they sense them. And they can put them themselves. They can put themselves in the shoes of the others naturally without asking for it. So it, it makes for a relationship to be much easier because you don't have to try intellectually to put yourself in the shoe of somebody else to see why he would say what he said or do what he did. And then at the same time, when you you you, you when you when you rise up in vibration, closer to the light, to the, the highlight, you, you affect your whole field. And, and the ones around you are automatically affected. You wake them up. You make them more alive than they were before. And, the, and, and then the harmony comes in because at the level of the highlight, there is only harmony. There cannot be disharmony. It doesn't even exist. So, okay, we're not there yet, but at least you bringing all your environment into a, a, a moment of harmony and you expand their mind because this whole idea of IQ or intelligence is ridiculous. Because we are, if we, we are part of the creator, we have access to infinite intelligence. And the way to, write, to open up our IQ, what we think is IQ, is not by, by doing some brain game on the computer, it's by rising up closer to the creator, at which point you start thinking in total different ways. You change your, 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 your construct, your mental construct. Yeah, you, you have to have the intention to change. You have to, you have, to have the intention, yes. Yeah. Is Mother Nature, what we see occurring on the planet, is that a part of the collective consciousness? Mother Nature takes care not only of this planet, not only of this universe, but all the universes. It is the one manifested in creation and with all the mechanisms of creation. We are children of Mother Nature, meaning we're the children of the one, the feminine aspect. The first, first vibration is om, which means mother. It means ah is a, is a sound that, that's the most normal, easiest sound that will come out of your mouth is ah. You can, e is already a contraction. And m is when you take the two parts together, you start vibrating them together. It's a sign of pleasure, but it's also a sign of the mother and the multiplicity, the, the, in the, the multiplications, the, 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 the m sound, the mother sound. So the, the, she is, as of, she's the one holding us in her bosom. She's feeding us freely. She represents infinite love and unconditional love. We have hurt her tremendously. It was to be expected that we would have some kind of reaction in not understanding who Mother Nature is. But I always say to people, if you want to see God, don't look for God in a book. Go look for God in the living God. The living God is Mother Nature. It's right in front of you. You're here. That's it. <clears throat> Why does Mother Nature express anger, or is it anger? You don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Mama can get really angry. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> um, when does Mother Nature, I would write an answer to that one. The, um, she doesn't express anger. Yeah, I she, agree. She really does not. Yeah, it's that's not just anger. What we think is anger is yeah. not anger. Right. It's, it's, it's just a reaction to rebalance situations. But the pain she feels when she does that is, is beyond anything we can even imagine. 
because she is a being that's fully alive and godly and has emotions, because any being, anyone, whether it's a cat, whether it's model nature, you has emotions and thought. That's how you define a being, the emotions and the thought. And, and there's a tremendous amount of emotions in model nature. As a matter of fact, if you want to connect to mother nature, show love to a mother nature. Connect to her, not by watching the Discovery Channel, but by going, <laughs> you know, by going in outside and hug a tree. It's okay to hug right. a tree. They might I, arrest I you recently, recently, and all, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I hugged a big sequoia recently. Right. Yeah. Didn't change the world, but yes. changed, changed me a little bit. Yeah. She, she reacts to love. She, she, it's like a flower. You know, when you eat a plant and you don't give it love, you give it all the nutrients, it will, have, it will grow, but it, it, won't, it won't have this energy of life and love yeah. very strongly a in failure it. Failure to thrive. Kind of. And you won't thrive. And you were going to feel very tired. And you're going to say, oh, it's GMO, it doesn't matter. Well, yes, it does matter because you didn't give. Take a plant, even in your home, and give it love. You're going to see it flourishing and thriving, and, and then there's an interchange. It, that's what Mother Nature needs. So if you want to grow fruits and vegetables and you, you want to heal yourself, it's not, all, it's not so much what pesticide or not pesticide, even though I'm totally against any pesticide or GMO, especially. The, uh, it's, it's give it love. Literally, you will walk outside, go to your garden, and then you will, you will recreate yourself. Yeah, I mean, we've seen how club. emotion, love, and hate, how those emotions can affect things like water crystals as they're being yes. formed. And they proved it, yes. Yeah. Everything, everything, especially living things. And water is a living thing too, by the way. It is. We are mainly water. It's, you know. yeah. How are we doing on time? Uh, what time are we pushed to? Till 10, 15? Okay. I, I definitely, I want to get through this, but I, I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions on this topic, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions, are there not? Do you have questions? Okay. All right. So, um, are we becoming more and more disconnected from the co-creative consciousness by iPhones, all these devices that people seem to be buried in all the time. Yeah. Are you kidding? It's, it's, a, it's yeah. more than a distraction. Do you, think, do you think it was a coincidence that the, that the first uh, smartphone was called the Apple and it shows an Apple beaten? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. A, the fall of man, you know, Adam, that right. boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not even two generations later and I don't know. <laughs> Right. Well, when television yeah. came out, that was the biggest boom to the intelligence community that they'd ever had. Oh, they, they, we all, I was laughing all the time because they were talking about you know, people were afraid they're going to chip us. And, and I said, why would you want to chip somebody from the inside when you can be watching him? You, you want to see him. You want to hear right. what he's saying. This is the chip you carry. And they're all proudly carrying their chip all day long and then being monitored. But beyond that, it's disconnecting people from people. You see couples eating in restaurants and they don't even talk to each other. There's no communication. And if you want to talk to someone, I said, no, text me. I said, no, I'm not going to tell you I want to yeah. talk to you. You have to text. Right. Is this shared reality, is it truly a re an illusion? Which shared reality? You mean our reality the, the, here? The reality that we're sharing here right now is... Is what we're experiencing here right now an illusion? It, well, it, it, what is an illusion? It's, it, it's real. Reality is, is R-E-E-L-L-E-T. -E -E you know, it's, it's a real, it's like watching a movie. It, it, it's real. It's a, it's a manifested uh, a movie where we are active. This, it's all, that's all God can do is he can dream within his own enormous mind and keep everything in order so that we, we, as him, are active yeah. in this reality. Yeah. I guess if we're co-creating it, it's, re it's huh? real. If we're co-creating it, we're making we it real. We're co-creating, yeah, we're supposed to. He, he wants, and it's like you, you want your kids to, to work with you, you know? You don't want them to work against you and rebel against you. We're all children of God, all of us. I don't care what you, where you come from, what city, what mm -hmm. dimension, they're all children of God. I think I know the answer to this one. Um, if God is pure, why did he create hate? <clears throat> um, I, I guess <clears throat> you have to have a contrast 
between knowing what good and evil is. Um, but uh, uh, what what uh, what what is your what, why do you think fear is such a part of this reality? Well, that, that would be a multi-dimensional uh, answer. Let's let's. Why did he create? He didn't create evil. He created a system that allowed for us to feel separated from each other and not being totally telepathic, which I'm sure you have experienced. I've experienced being telepathic. It's a totally different ballgame at that point. Right. So when you, when you are when when you're working through the voice, through the senses, through to what we consider to be the five senses or six senses, uh, you you're you're operating with the risk of forgetting that. The person you're hurting, or the animal you're hurting, is you. It's, it's not. It's, it's still you. And then the, you, 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 you don't want to share. You don't want to cooperate. You, you're asking, what am I going to get if I share? It? You know, are you going to scratch my back first, or am I going to scratch your back? And how much is it going to cost? And then what? And then you go into accounting and balancing. That's not God. That's no. us. He knew this. Of course, he knew this. Yeah. And, and, and he also knew. I, I, I don't know why I'm saying he, but. Well, the creator also the creator, knew that, active mode, yeah. Yeah, that, that all evolution occurs through stress. Yes. So if we did not have these negative things occurring, we didn't have the traumas, we're, we're not going to evolve. We're just going to be at a status quo. Mm -hmm. So I guess we need to learn how to appreciate the traumas once we've learned from them and, then, and, and move on. That's very profound, yeah. Because what you're saying, which is true, is that there is a this creation, which is in, magnificent, but on the level of training is considered to be a very low and difficult training. It's almost the, the last training before you graduate here, yeah, from kindergarten, okay, from <laughs> the higher school. Right. But it's still the last training. It's extremely difficult. The creator knows it. And this is a distillation process of consciousness. You don't get to go to a higher level creation or even to eventually get your own creation because we don't realize that all the children of the one are supposed eventually after one point or another to become real true co-creators, cosmic creators, and get a co-creation. The one can co-create as many creations as it wants. It's not a problem. But we are being tested as far as quality of consciousness, not quantity. And everything here is quantity. You know, bring, bring masses to people together, or add more money, or, or, or one, you know, a million plus a million is two million. And I've, that's not how he is. He's not judging uh, ourselves because of we did good or bad. He's judging us to see if we are, if we are of the quality that's enough to go to a higher level. And that's why when you said we are getting those traumas, yes, you should say thank you sometimes for the traumas because when you get a lot of traumas, it means you're almost out, you're almost going up. It's a sign that you're about to graduate. Right. Yeah, <laughs> if you don't get burn. anything, you don't tell that to people, but yes. Yeah, yeah. that's, recently I was told I was going through a karmic quick burn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it definitely felt, I has feel felt like it. Yeah. I'm yeah. still in it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. I'm sorry, how much time do we have left? How much time do we have left? About 20 minutes. About 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do a couple more questions and then... Okay, next one. How, how does uh, remote viewing deep meditation, how does that help with memory retrieval? I know a lot of people have uh, been trying to figure out if they have suppressed memories. Um, you know, what are the best ways to uh, retrieve those memories? I know some people are uh, going to a regression therapist can mm -hmm. be good, but you know, you've got to find one that's really reputable. They can uh, front load you with information by accident. Yeah, uh, yeah easily. Yeah. Easily, yeah. I mean, what, what, is, what is your answer to that? It's funny that you said I used to do a lot of past self regressions just as, as a game years ago. And I finally came, I managed to get most of the ladies that I was doing um, past self regression to become Cleopatra because she was very popular in those times. And, 
I would front load them, but I would do it in a, I, di I didn't do this as a joke. I did this I, to see if I could, and they would give me all the details of the life of Cleopatra, and it would more or less fit one with the other. So then I was asking myself, well, is reincarnation real, or where am I getting this information from? I mean, they, they were describing things that the average person had no idea about Cleopatra. So there is a, an area in the mind, called the God mind, where it's like a library, some people call it the Akasha library, you call it anything you want, but it's, where the, re, it, the memory is kept vibrated there. It's like a memory bank in a computer. If you take off the electricity totally, it's just gonna go, so you keep a little electricity so it's vibrated and stays there. They can access that information. Were they really Cleopatra? I don't know. But is it important for them to, to think they were Cleopatra? I don't, sometimes they do, well, it's good for your all ego. One, if we're all one, right. they were Cleopatra. Exactly, they were right. Cleopatra, you're right. So they were Cleopatra. But to go back more importantly to what do you do when some, some people have had really traumatic, extremely traumatic memories? I, I think there are many ways of addressing it. You can bring back the memory to the forefront, but that's extremely dangerous because when you bring a memory to the forefront, all the associated emotions that they felt. The, the mind does not know future, past, or future, or, 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 or there's no time for the mind. There's only the now. So when you bring it back and they're reliving it, they, it's as if they're reliving, reliving it again. The fact that the mind will hide this in the background of the subconscious is a natural way of hiding the pain away. Right. Do you understand? So it has, you, have to, you have to decide whether you want to do this. I would rather go and change the past. Believe it or not, the same way you can affect the future, you can affect the past. You can go in a, in a very deep state, like let's say, especially theta, and then you really leave, you, we have a, 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 a whole part of the course we, we introduce people to something called the diamond body. They're basically recreating themselves physically, they can change the way they look, and it, trust me, it works. Mentally, and also spiritually, but also as far as the memory banks. They can recreate and decide, that this is, I don't accept this as my, my background or my past, and they make up a past, like people that believe in having multiple personalities and then they believe that they've had different pasts. Yeah, I know it, that works. It, it can be a very powerful tool. Yeah, I, I, I have done exercises to where I send messages to myself in the past. Mm -hmm. Like if I forgot to bring something on a trip, I will sit there and, and consciously try to send a message to myself in the past. And I train myself to always be uh, listening for that little nudge for myself in the future. And there have been several times that uh, it's worked out very beneficial for me. Right. And you know, f right now with the quantum computers and quantum physics, it's been proven, the delayed choice experiment has been proven so that a reality that's concretized now in the material world by our observation is sending waves in the past, changing the past, sending waves in the future, changing the future at the same time, and then presenting us with a present. That's physics. You know, they can blind themselves, the, 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 you know, all the people that, that will not accept it, but this has been proven in laboratory uh, uh, experiments yeah. since uh, 2010, 12, and but very strongly so now. Yeah. Well, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, pretty much we're going to. I think we're going to go to uh, questions from the audience. Um, I definitely want to thank you, Gerald, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> a, a lot of people. A, many people may not realize this, but uh, it was about 1996, about three years after Stacey and I got married, I was looking for a good remote viewing course, and I, had, I was looking at all of them, and uh, when you, your remote influencing information came out, I bought it, and it was, when we first got married, we were so broke, and I, I can't remember how much the course was back then, but... Uh, w no, she remembers. <laughs> because, I mean, we were like destitute, and I'm ordering a course on um, remote viewing. Yeah. And for her at the time, she, before her download and her awakening, it was not uh, an easy thing for me to, um, to 
to get approved. But the interesting thing is that after the course, I was so impressed, I sent you an email. Yeah. And I told you about how when I was a kid, I would project myself outside of the car above the freeway, you know, as a way to pass the time. And I thought everyone else could do it. And you actually called me. I was working at Stream International. It was my first IT job. Uh -huh. You called me and we spoke. I, I didn't, I was real busy. I didn't have time to really talk, but you were asking me uh, a lot of questions. Uh -huh. And it's really interesting that, you know, fast forward over 20 years, you know, here we are. It's exactly together. Me. Right. Uh, so I appreciate things, it. Things happen for a reason. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it too. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks. Uh -huh. Okay, wow. I was just watching the news in the background when all of a sudden this pops up. Trump makes comments about human trafficking and slightly alludes to uh, Pedogate or Pizzagate or whatever it's called. Um, pretty interesting. Things are moving in the background. I'm asking in my ear because uh, I'm told that we now have video and sound of President Trump leading a listening session on human trafficking at the White House. Let's listen. Thank you, everybody. Very nice. Nice to see you. Well, I want to thank Dina and Ivanka and everybody for working so hard to set this up. It's been so important to them, and I want to make it clear today that my administration will focus on ending the absolutely horrific practice of human trafficking, and I am prepared to bring the full force and weight of our government to the federal and at the federal level and the other highest levels, whatever we can do in order to solve this horrific problem, getting worse, and it's happening in the United States, in addition to the rest of the world, but it's happening in the United States, which is terrible. Human trafficking is a dire problem, both domestically and internationally, and is one that's made a really uh, a challenge, and it's really made possible to a large extent, uh, more of a modern phenomenon, by what's taking place on the internet, as you probably know. Solving the human trafficking epidemic, which is what it is, is a priority for my administration. I'm going to help out a lot.